And they basically say, you are here in my kitchen. I have my coffee machine here, my computer here. There's a plant on top of me. Um, uh, I'm here, as you can probably tell from my voice, I'm a little bit sick. I'm currently isolating for COVID. I'm sad that we're not going to get to finish Jonah chapter four together, uh, but at least I can give you this video just to help you think about it a little bit more. Um, Think about where we've been in Jonah. Um, Jonah is asked to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, Israel's great enemy. And he hates them so much that he decides to go in the complete opposite direction to try to get away from them. There's a huge storm um, and an attempt to try to kill himself, I think, uh, so that he doesn't have to go preach to these people. He throws himself into the water or gets the the men to throw him into the water. He's swallowed by a huge fish. Uh, In the fish, he cries out to God. God hears him and he spat up on the shores of Nineveh. He preaches, does a really bad job of preaching to the people of Nineveh. And miraculously, the whole city, all of them, from the youngest to the oldest, even their animals, they all repent and change from their evil ways. And this is where we left off in chapter 3. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Now, here's what what I think. That's... 100% 100% where the story should end, <laughs> okay? So, you know, Jonah's been a bad guy and he's run off, and, but he's finally done the right thing and he's preached in Nineveh and he is now the most successful preacher that has ever lived in the history of the planet. He's preached a terrible sermon, but literally thousands, I think later on we'll hear 120,000 people have responded to his sermon. He's the greatest preacher ever. Never mind Billy Graham. Ne- never mind Jonathan Edwards, never mind Timothy Keller, whatever preacher you like, he's 100% the greatest preacher ever, and everyone's happy. The people who are being in the pr- oppressed in Nineveh are happy because now the Ninevites are good people again. The Israelites are happy because their enemy is now a peaceful and loving enemy. Surely that's where the story should end. But it doesn't end there. It keeps going. This is Jonah's response to the fact that God didn't destroy the Ninevites. In chapter 4 we read, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became very angry. Do you know what he's saying there? This is astonishing. He's basically calling God evil. He's saying, God, you are wrong. You are evil. You've done the wrong thing here. And this is what he says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. The whole reason he fled the other way was because he knew this was going to happen. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah is so angry. He's so frustrated. He's so upset that God hasn't destroyed this people group that he would prefer to die than to live in a world where God is gracious to these people that he hates. He says it again later in verse 8. He says, it would be better for me to die than to live. Now, here's the interesting thing about this story as I've been reflecting on it this this week. Jonah, from chapter 1 to chapter 4, does not learn anything. (laughs) His theology... The the way that he thinks about God, that line, I know that you are a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That is the same in verse 1 of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 4. Jonah's theology doesn't change. So what happens in this story? Jonah is coming face to face with the reality of what his theology means. And what does it mean? It means this, if God is gracious and compassionate and loving, he is gracious and compassionate and loving to everyone, even Jonah's enemies. And that, that whole thing is too hard for Jonah to bear. He cannot bear the fact that God will be gracious and loving and compassionate to everyone. So what are we seeing? Jonah's hatred for these people the Ninevites, is stronger than his theology. (laughs) He preferred to hold on to his hatred for this people group uh, than to trust 
in the love and grace of God for, for all people. Are you following me with that? Now, here's my question for you in, in all of that. Who is, who is your Nineveh? Which person, which group of people uh, do you think is so evil, um, so worthy of judgment and wrath that you don't want God to love them or that you don't want God to uh, forgive them? Which group of people do you look at, you know, if God was to accept them? You know, if you come across a group of people or a person in heaven, um, if you came across them, which person would you go, oh, God, that seems a bit unfair, <laughs> you know? <laughs> maybe it's Hitler. Uh, maybe it's Pol Pot. Um, there's this great moment in a, a story by C.S. Lewis. Uh, the story's called The Great Divorce. And the basic premise of the story is that people get to take a day trip from hell or Hades and they're offered the opportunity to come into heaven or to, um, to the new creation that God has created where the world is perfect. They're given the opportunity to come in, but for each person that comes, there's always a barrier for them, something that they have to give up in order to come into heaven. And for this one person, he, he comes to the gates of heaven from Hades um, and he looks in there and he sees in heaven a murderer, someone who is... Uh, who is known to his community as, as a murderer, and he is welcomed inside heaven. He's welcomed there because of the goodness and love of God uh, in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This guy is standing, and he's looking into heaven, and finally he refuses to go in. And he says, I don't want to be there if he is welcome there. He says, I was heaps better on earth than him. I lived a good life. I tried to help people. I was kind to people. I was compassionate. I don't want to live in a world where a murderer can live in the same heaven as I live. So he kind of goes back to Hades and decides to live there instead. I wonder whether this is a little bit of what's going on here in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah is saying, I don't want to live in a world where wicked people get to be saved. Where God loves wicked people as much as anyone else. So who is it for you? Who's your Nineveh? Who are you tempted to believe that God shouldn't love? Who are you angry at? And what do you do about that? The story continues and um, Jonah, he climbs up on a, on a hill overlooking the city of Nineveh. And I think what he's doing is he, he, he's up there and he's, he's looking on the city and he's hoping that God will change his mind. You get that? He's hoping that God will change his mind from changing his mind. So he's hoping that God will actually destroy this city and he's kind of waiting and, and looking for it. He builds himself a shelter. Obviously, it's not a, a very great shelter because um, God causes a plant to grow. The plant grows up and it it, it gives Jonah some shade, some shade from the hot sun. And we're told that Jonah um, loves this plant. This plant eases his discomfort, that he feels joy and happiness about this plant. Uh, and then in the morning, God causes a worm to come and eat the plant. It's not there anymore. And then a hot wind comes and Jonah is just sitting there completely uncomfortable. And he says, it would be better for me to die than to live. And then God says to Jonah in verse 8, Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should not I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also so many animals? you see what's going on here? God is saying, you care for this plant, even though you didn't do anything for it. Of course, I'm going to care for these humans in Nineveh who are created and who I love. What are we learning here about God and humanity? I think we're learning something very, very uh, interesting. There is no in and out groups with God. There never has been. 
God doesn't love some people more than others. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, how you identify, what you look like, how much money you earn, how smart you are, how pretty you are. There is no in and out group with God. He sees all humans as his children. And he wants all humans to live in his ways. Not for him so much, but for them. So they can live in love and peace and justice and truth together. This is the Christian message, I think, uh, BCC. That God loves all people and he wants them to come into relationship with him. And he loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them so that it would not be their good works that would make them okay in the sight of God, but it would be their trust and their belief in Jesus, the love of Jesus that would make them right. You can't have grace for yourself and then works for someone else. (laughs) Do you hear that? If it's going to be grace, it's grace for everyone. If it's going to be works, it's works for everyone. And if it's works, we're all stuffed because none of us live the perfect life. But if it's grace, it's grace for everyone, even the people that you hate. Um, I want it to be grace because I need grace as much as anyone else. And you do too. Amen. Amen.